We'll be there just in case. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see each and every one of you. <clears throat> I did want to uh, mention that this section over here looks great this morning. You know, just look great. <laughs> well, if, uh, well, I'll tell you what, we'll start this way. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of your precious Son, Jesus, I come to you and I lift up this time that we use to look to your word and to hear from you. I pray, God, that your spirit would strengthen me to exalt your Son, that uh, your word be rightly explained, and that it would press upon our hearts as you want it to, Lord, and, and move us to worship you, to know you. I pray, God, that you would move in the hearts of of each of those that are gathered this morning, I, I pray for a special measure of grace on them. And I thank you again for the glorious opportunity we have, Lord, of being your children, of, of gathering here each week uh, to give you praise and honor. And in your holy name I pray, amen. Well, if you are, <clears throat> excuse me, if you are visiting with us or if this is your first time here, then it will help you to know uh, that I don't usually use a bookmark. It comes after Jonah. I'm getting there. I had to, there we go. Okay. Uh, no, it'll help you to know that we're going. Uh, we're preaching through the Old Testament book of Micah on Sunday mornings right now. This will be the eighth message in Micah, and as you saw just from the uh, scripture reading a minute ago, we're going to be in the the last half of chapter five. Our lead pastor, Todd Malone, has titled this uh, series, Who is Like God? Because that is what the name Micah means, who is like Yah, which is short for Yahweh, who is like God. <clears throat> and his prophecy repeatedly affirms this truth that no one is like God. The expected answer, of course, is no one. No one can stand beside God. He stands alone in his greatness. And uh, I'm tempted to, to riff on that theme for a little bit, but uh, instead I'm going to focus on the passage that we're looking at today because this passage, like all of those in Scripture, will affirm that truth as well, that no one stands beside God. He is incomparable in His greatness. There is no one like Yahweh. To lead into this passage, I want you to think about pure gold, the substance, pure gold. And I'm not talking about the kind of gold that you would find uh, laying on the ground, or <laughs> we don't usually find gold laying on the ground, do we? That you would dig for and find, <laughs> or that you would get by uh, prospecting in Alaska or something like that. I'm talking about refined, pure gold. If you want pure gold, the purest gold, then you have to connect with the Royal Canadian Mint. Are there any Canadians in here this morning? Here. <laughs> this is for you, Brad. The Royal Canadian Mint produces the purest gold in the entire world. So if you want the purest gold, you go to the Royal Canadian Mint. Now this coin that I uh, have a picture of up here, it was created for the 150th anniversary of uh, Confederation of Canada in 2017. And it's made of gold, and you'll, you'll see it there on the side, it's made of gold that's called Five Nines Fine. Five Nines Fine. Don't, don't try to say that fast, it'll trip you up. And what that means is that this gold is 99.999% pure. Five nines fine. Now, in order to get five nines fine gold, you have to take out contaminants and impurities. You have to remove what isn't gold from the gold in bulk. You have to take it through a process of purification. And purification is what this passage is talking about in Micah. Except God, of course, is not talking about purifying gold. He's talking about purifying the human heart, which is a much, much more difficult process. In fact, only God is capable of that process of purifying a human heart. So in Micah 5, 10 to 15, God makes a promise to Israel, and he promises them that one day he is going to purify them completely. Now, before we get into the uh, passage itself, I want you to look at this chart uh, that, that Todd made for us. It visually represents the structure of the book of Micah. There are three uh, sections that each begin with a call from God to Israel, saying, here, listen to what I'm about to say. And then it's followed in uh, various forms by a word of judgment, telling them where they've uh, violated his covenant and where they've strayed from him. And then each of those sections ends with a word of hope. And as you'll see from the chart there, the section we're on today is at the second 
excuse me, at the end of the second hope section. Uh, you may remember also that, that Todd referred to this section as the journey of hope because there are multiple things that God's talking about doing as, as he's moving his people from where they are to where they're going to be. It began with grace for the defeated. God talked about gathering the lame and the outcast of Israel, gathering them into a remnant that he would then uh, provide for and that he would send his Messiah to rule over. Uh, it was followed by transformation as God turns his people into agents of his presence. And then today it continues with purification. Now, important, an important point to remember about this passage, the fulfillment of it is still future. Uh, the, you'll remember uh, when, when Taylor was reciting it, it began with in that day. So it's looking to a future time, and, and that day is referring to the time when God's Messiah, Jesus, is physically reigning on the earth, a, a time that we refer to as the millennial kingdom, <clears throat> when Jesus is, is physically on the throne and he's ruling and reigning over the earth. But even though this passage's fulfillment is in the future, there's still a lot of truth we can get out of it. For today, in addition to, of course, reminding us of how great God is, uh, but also I think you'll see some things that can impact your life right now. So with that in mind, let's look at the text. The passage has two points. The first is this, God will destroy everything his people trust in. <clears throat> Pardon me. Everything his people trust in apart from himself. God himself wanted to be the total confidence of the Israelites. He wanted to be the one who was their trust complete because he alone is worthy of their trust. And he promises to Israel that one day he's going to purify them from that divided trust by removing everything that, has, that they trust in except for himself. He promises to remove those things that draw their trust away from him, saying, in effect, I'll remove these temptations and you'll trust in me alone because you won't have anything else. I'm going to take all the crutches and props away from you until only I am left. Biblical scholar Stephen Dempster in his commentary on Micah says this section that we're going to read in just a moment shows the comprehensive nature of Yahweh's reform. It destroys all false objects of trust until Yahweh is left alone. And just like impurities have to be taken away from gold in order to make fine gold, these false objects of trust have to be taken away to purify the people of God. Now, in, in this section, God talks about... Uh, false objects of trust in three categories, military might, magic, and idolatry. And the first he addresses is military might. So let's look at that together. Verses 10 and 11 says this, And in that day, declares the Lord, I will cut off your horses from among you and will destroy your chariots. And I will cut off the cities of your land and throw down all your strongholds. Now this verse is talking about the offensive and defensive military might that Israel had. And, uh, for instance, horses and chariots were used uh, for the speedy deployment of troops. They, they were the tanks and planes of their day. <clears throat> and they were usually used for offensive purposes, when you're going to conquer, when you're going to expand your territory. And these things were a temptation to Israel, the temptation being that they would put their confidence in having horses and chariots. So why worry about the nation's relationship to God? Why worry about our fulfillment of God's covenant requirements if we have horses and chariots. We're okay. So our safety is, is taken care of. And for that reason, God didn't want them to have these things. Uh, Deuteronomy 17, 16 forbids kings of Israel from acquiring many horses. And then in Isaiah chapter 2, when Isaiah is listing all the sins that the people of Israel are guilty of, he mentions the fact that Israel is filled with horses and chariots. So they had built up this offensive uh, military firepower for the purposes of putting their trust in that. Zechariah 9.10 mentions cutting off chariot and war horse when Messiah comes to reign, which is exactly what Micah is talking about here. At the beginning of the book of Micah, at the first, uh, right after there's the first call, and then he begins to uh, lay out the charges against them, the judgment, he actually m implies that trust in military might was where Israel's sin began. He says this in verse 13. Harness the steeds to the chariots inhabitants of Lachish. It was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion. Now, the, uh, these two words, horses and chariots, possibly put you in mind of uh, Psalm chapter 20 because it's directly addressed there, but in a positive way. Uh, excuse me, it's answered in a positive way. It says this, some trust in chariots and some in horses, 
but we put our trust in the name of the Lord our God. So in addition to removing these offensive measures, God says, I'm also going to remove your defensive measures, your cities and your strongholds. Walled cities were used to protect against invading armies. Uh, You know, back then, typically a village would just be a loose collection of houses and farms. But if you gathered together in a big group and made a city, you would want to put a wall around it to protect you from any invading armies. And uh, strongholds refers to buildings that would house troops or that would also be used in some strategic way to defend the nation. And Israel was continually tempted to put their trust in these things for their survival, for their protection, for their peace and security. But God says, I am going to destroy all of that. I'm going to take away all of those temptations. God will be their protector. God will be their security. In verse 8 of chapter 5, when he talks about the Messiah coming, he says, he will be their peace. So God is saying, I am here to provide everything that you think you need these other things for. Put your trust completely in me. There's no need for military might when Messiah comes to reign because he will keep them secure and at peace. Now, before I move on to the second category of uh, objects of false worship, let's bring this idea home for just a minute. Now, Israel was tempted to trust in the physical thing, implements of war, both offensive and defensive, instead of trusting fully in God. What, what physical things are we tempted to trust in for our security and peace? Maybe for you, it's money. You've uh, been wise with your finances. You've had a good paying job for years. Maybe you've got a seven-figure sum in your IRA. I congratulate you. Are you tempted to trust in your money for security now and in the future instead of God? Or... Thinking about the uh, idea of defense again, suppose you have a very nice high-tech, high-dollar alarm system installed at your house to protect your possessions and your family. Are you tempted to trust in that alarm system for your peace of mind and your security instead of God? Well, the right answer to both of those questions is yes. Yes, you are tempted. Each and every one of us in here is a fallen human being. We are hardwired to trust in things other than God. So yes, every one of us is tempted to trust in the things around us for security and peace. Now think about what God indicted here. There's nothing inherently sinful about a chariot or a horse or a city or a stronghold, just as there's nothing inherently sinful about an IRA or about an alarm system. But God is saying, I want you to be aware of the danger. I want you to be aware of the possibility of your trust being weakened in me because it starts to be put in other things. Now, there are probably a number of of strategies for opposing that in your life that you can think of. The two that come to my mind are prayer and confession. So, uh, for instance, Israel had these fortified cities. Now, that that was a wise precaution, right? They were a small country surrounded by enemies, constantly at war. So that was a wise precaution. You have an alarm system that may be a wise precaution for you. Having an IRA is a wise precaution. So what can you do then to oppose that? temptation to go, okay, that's, uh, that's where I feel peace of mind because I have that much money in my IRA. Well, you can start by thanking the Lord for providing this thing, just as Israel could have thanked the Lord for providing walled cities and strongholds. And you can thank the Lord that he is ultimately your protection. Confess to him that he's your protector and that even if these things were taken away, you would still be taken care of because you belong to him. And that was something Israel didn't tend to do. They tended to run headlong into this divided trust. Now, I won't spend as much time on these next two categories because magic and idolatry are very obviously sinful, so it's not as uh, difficult to see why God would have such a problem with them and and, and want to purify his people of them. But uh, let's go ahead and look at them. The second category of false objects of faith is magic. So look look with me at verse 12. God also says, and I will cut off sorceries from your hand, and you shall have no more tellers of fortunes. Sorceries and tellers of fortune are both aspects of magic that was practiced in those days. Uh, It's talking about casting spells, using signs to make decisions or tell the future, trying to manipulate the spirit world. This was another temptation of Israel uh, to turn to magic for protection or guidance. You may remember that uh, in Numbers chapter 22, there was a man by the name of Balaam who was a prophet. And he was hired by the king of Moab to stop Israel. But he didn't ask 
uh, Balaam to raise an army. What he wanted Balaam to do was curse Israel so that they could not continue to take over the uh, land of Canaan as God has, had promised them. So magic was used in warfare back then as well, not just for, for guidance or personal blessing. And as Israel began to be influenced by the pagan peoples around them, they also began to lean on magic to make them secure. Uh, you also remember that King Saul, at one point after he had been uh, basically rejected as king by God, and he wanted to talk to uh, the prophet Samuel, who was dead, he went to a witch to, to, uh, to get a message. Uh, so again, he was leaning on magic, just as Israel was tempted to do. <clears throat> now keep in mind, this wasn't a case of the Israelites denying the existence of God. Okay, it wasn't as if they were saying, I don't believe any of that stuff. Don't believe the Exodus. Don't believe the prophets. Don't believe any of that stuff. They weren't saying that. It was kind of like they were hedging their bets. It was like, okay, we know Yahweh is real. He's our God. He's our king. He's done all this for us. But he's not doing what we want him to do right now. So maybe there's something else we can turn to. There's another spiritual force that we can turn to in order to get things to happen that we want them to happen. God didn't give them what they wanted when they wanted, so they turned to another spirit for help. Now, God promises one day to destroy these as well. Magic will not be practiced among you. I will remove it completely. There won't even be the temptation to turn to it. Now, once again, let's turn this to modern times. Do we, as the church of God, turn to magic? Well, not typically. Uh, I, I cannot remember the last time a friend of mine said, hey, Slade, I've Went and visited the Palm Reader on Highway 80 because I'm trying to make this big decision about a job. You know, didn't know it. that doesn't typically happen, right? We don't typically give in to that, that brazen temptation to magic. Uh, it's not a prevalent sin among believers. However, there's more subtle ways that we're tempted to turn to spiritual forces outside of God in order to uh, fulfill us or to bring us security and peace. And one that comes to mind is superstition. Superstition. It's alive and well today. Uh, Old Testament professor Scott Redd writes this, any object, behavior, or belief that you invest with the power to save you or to give you good things apart from the power of the living God is a pious talisman and is driving you away from the gospel. Basically what he's saying is if there's something that you're leaning on to bring you what God has promised to bring you, if you're something you're leaning on in the place of God, you're using it like a charm or a talisman or an amulet. For instance, maybe you always wear a cross necklace because you believe that you're protected from harm when you're wearing that necklace. Or maybe you put a verse of scripture up on the wall in your living room because you believe that will protect you from Satan's influence. These things are nothing more than superstitious talismans if you trust in them instead of trusting in God himself. If you lose your cross necklace or if the verse on your wall is knocked off, you are no less protected before because it is God who is your protector, not the necklace or the verse itself. The last category of false faith objects is idolatry. Look with me at uh, verses 13 and 14. And I will cut off your carved images and your pillars from among you, and you shall bow down no more to the work of your hands, and I will root out your Asherah images from among you and destroy your cities. The first thing you mentioned uh, to be destroyed is carved images, and uh, of course that's pretty obvious what that is. It is a carved image uh, representing some pagan deity carved out of wood or stone. Uh, pillars may not be as obvious. Pillar, uh, pillar of stone or wood was often used to represent uh, one of the Canaanite gods, uh, such as uh, Baal or uh, Ashtoreth. And Asherah images. Asherah was a goddess among the Canaanites, a goddess of fertility, and uh, they were often would plant a wooden pole or a tree uh, in honor of Asherah. So Asherah images is, is uh, another object that was turned to. Now, the last term, though, may sound out of place. So God's like, okay, I'm going to cut off all these idolatrous things, and I'm going to destroy your cities. What? Why, why did he even say that? Because in a few, a few verses earlier, he had just said, I'm going to take away your cities in relation to this military might uh, temptation. Well, here, what he must be referring to is the cities where idolatry was the most prevalent, where it flourished, and they're, they're, uh, thereafter influenced the rest of the nation. The point is that Israel often put its faith in false gods, and God promises to remove these things from the land when Messiah is in charge. 
the, uh, I lost my place. Where was I? When Messiah is in charge. Oh, okay, yes. Uh, so the point is that, so God's saying again, you know, look, you're not going to be tempted to trust in these things because I'm going to take them all away. They're going to be completely removed from the land. Now, something that's going to happen during the reign of Messiah is that our hearts are also going to be energized, strengthened, and perfected because Back then, you will remember from reading all the history of the kings of Israel, every now and then a king that was good would arise, at least in the southern kingdom, like Hezekiah. And he would say, okay, we're getting rid of all these idols. Get them out of here. Burn them down. Tear down their temples. It's done. And then Hezekiah dies, and what happens? They, <laughs> he's dead. That's exactly right. <laughs> They go right back to it because their hearts didn't change. Hezekiah tried to reform them by taking all these things away, but he could not change the people's hearts. But God is saying, you know, someday I am going to change your heart and I'm also going to take away the temptations. So there's a heart change. There's an external change in your circumstance. You won't have the temptation. Idolatry will be done away with. Now, when it comes to idolatry, I don't think anyone would argue that the church today is immune to that. Uh, in this verse, God is specifically talking about uh, the narrow sense of the term idolatry, where you're literally bowing down and worshiping a, a carved image or a false god. But if we think about idolatry in the broader sense, whenever we put anything in the place of God, whenever we give the worship that is due to God to something else, that being idolatry, I think we'd all agree that that is rampant within all of us because we are sinful people. Uh, I'll get personal for just a minute. About 20 years ago, I realized that uh, my favorite sports team, the Dallas Cowboys, had become an idol for me. Now, 20 years ago, that made more sense. <laughs> <just today. laughs> so for you younger people, <laughs> there was a time when there was a high level of success there. Uh, and I realized that they had become an idol for me because uh, what I was doing was basing my joy and my contentment on their performance, my thoughts were consumed with them. I, I was worshiping them. It was it was idolatry, and uh, so God made them go <laughs> losing streak. I don't know. And, uh, maybe my fault, guys. I'm, I apologize for that. So thinking about that analogously for yourself, what's in that place for you? What or who? Do you base your contentment and your joy on? What do you look to to find your identity? Where do you put your highest affection and commitment? If it is anything other than God, then it is idolatry. If you realize that you have something like that, and let's be honest, all of us do, right? All of us are tempted to that because, again, we have a sinful nature. Confess that to the Lord. And receive his forgiveness a hundred times a day if necessary. I mean, if the Cowboys start getting successful again, I may have to do that, right? Uh, it could happen, okay? Doubters. Uh, the Lord, let me tell you this. The Lord will not get tired of you coming to him over and over again, even if you feel like you're stumbling over the same thing again and again. The Lord is a loving father. He treats you as a beloved child because of the work of Jesus Christ. He does not get tired. He does not push you away. Jesus said in John chapter 6, if anyone comes to me, I will never cast him out. The Lord does not get tired of your failings and your, your backslidings and your trippings and your sinful tendencies. He keeps opening his arms saying, come to me, come to me. I love you. I'll wash you. I'll forgive you. <clears throat> and let me add this. God is not saying that you need to be perfect in your devotion to him in order to be accepted by him. He does say that anything less than total devotion is sin, right? Someone asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? What did he say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Who does that all the time? Please don't raise your hand. Please don't. <laughs> None of us do that all the time. There's one man who did that throughout his entire life, and that's Jesus of Nazareth. And then he offered his life for us to pay for the times that we don't do that. He rose from the dead, gives forgiveness to all who will come to him. And he treats us as his beloved child, even in the midst of us falling and rising and falling and rising. Out of his love for us, oh, I just said that. Skip ahead. Uh, Jesus suffered and died for our sins, even the sin of idolatry. So even though you're still falling short, you are accepted 
as a beloved child because Jesus' righteousness is credited to us. So when you trust in Christ, God unites you to Jesus in such a way that you are treated as if you did all that, as if you lived a perfect life, as if you died to sin, as if you were resurrected. So think about how God treats Jesus. Does he ever treat him with anger? Well, there was one time, and that was for us, right? When Jesus absorbed the wrath of God. But God is never upset with Jesus for sinning because Jesus never sins. Jesus has never disappointed God. And so when you are in Christ, you are living a life of complete and total acceptance, even in the midst of knowing you're giving in to this sometimes. God loves you and delights in you right now, not just one day when you're going to be perfected, again, because of Jesus. Now, having said that, even though we're not going to achieve perfection in this life, even though that is yet to come, if you don't realize that you're giving in to idolatry, then you won't even oppose it in your life. So that's why being exposed to the sin in your life is a mercy. It is a blessing from God because that enables us then to work against it, work against it to deepen our relationship with him and grow in our faith. Something that uh, probably jumped out at you when Taylor read the passage earlier or recited the passage earlier. I'm still impressed with that, Taylor. You, you're, this guy's fantastic scripture reader. Uh, something that may have jumped out at you is the violent language that God uses here because he says, I will cut off. I will cut off, I will destroy, I will throw down, I will root out. Because he is emphasizing the seriousness of the situation. Putting your trust in anything other than God alone is dangerous to you and dishonoring to God, and it disrupts our communion with him. But how well you're fighting idolatry doesn't determine your standing before God. Because if it did, then we're all lost. What determines our standing before God, what determines our acceptance as beloved children is the absolute perfect life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that will never change. Your spiritual strength may ebb and flow, but the life, death, resurrection of Christ stands forever. And that is what your acceptance as a child is based on. So he said, God will destroy everything his people will trust in apart from himself. Matthew Henry said this, it is a great mercy to be deprived of those things which we have, in which we have reposed a confidence, he says in his great uh, 18th century way, in which we've rested uh, in competition with God. So basically what he's saying is when God removes something from your life that you were trusting in, that was dividing your trust, that is God's mercy, that is not God's anger. That is not God's punishment. That is God's love and his mercy. His promise to purify Israel is part of the journey of hope because it is merciful and gracious of him to purify his people. Okay, the second point of this passage, and I promise I won't go as long on this one, is this. God will destroy all nations that do not obey him. Don't you like it when God's talking about destroying? Isn't there part of you that just, guys, anybody who's with me on that, just kind of stirs your blood. God will destroy all nations that do not obey him. There's always a temptation to trust in something that to, other than God, and God says, I'm going to remove that. But there's also a temptation to fear things other than God. Is this maybe uh, maybe that, that thing is a little bigger than God, so I'm, I'm scared of that. You worry about your security due to a threat, due to an enemy, and it looks like this doesn't fit necessarily with this theme of purification, but I, I think it's connected because God is saying, I'm going to take care of all my enemies, which means I'm going to take care of all your enemies. There is nothing that you will have to fear, so you can rest in me. That's another reason why you won't, don't ever need to be tempted to rely on military might, because it's going to be gone. All threats, all enemies are going to be vanquished. He promised to destroy the things that would draw away their trust, and now he's promising to destroy that which would cause them to fear. Physical enemies wouldn't draw away their trust, but the threat could shake their trust in God. Verse 15 says, And in anger and wrath I will execute vengeance on the nations that did not obey. This is an echo of uh, Psalm 2, and I'm just going to read a little bit from that. Uh, it says this, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Who's he talking about? Yeah, a little louder. Jesus. Very good, yes. You are my son. He's talking about Jesus. Today I have begotten you. 
Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Now listen to this. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. In the day that Messiah sets up his rule on earth, God will take his vengeance on those nations that do not bow before his anointed one. The Lord Jesus will execute uh, vengeance on the nations that refuse to submit to his rule, and they will not be destroyed by the armies of Israel. They will be destroyed by Jesus himself. Revelation 19.15 says, From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. So God is promising Israel judgment is coming on those nations that reject me. Judgment is coming, but there is hope. You don't have to experience the wrath of the Lion of Judah. Kiss the Son, submit to the Son, trust in the Son, and you'll be saved. I didn't read this part because I was saving it, but at the end of Psalm 2, when he's saying Jesus is going to uh, strike the nations with the rod of iron, he's going to be the absolute ruler. Listen up, bow before him. At the end of it, it says, Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Matthew 11, Jesus said, come to me and I will give you rest. 1 Peter 2, 6 says, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the wrath of King Jesus is for those who do not obey the call to trust him, but for those who trust him, he offers pardon, full, free, complete pardon and acceptance into his family forever. Now, it may sound at first glance like this is over the top. It sounds like Jesus is saying, uh, or that God is saying, okay, listen to me or I will end you. And it's true, that is what he's saying. (laughs) But it doesn't have to, uh, uh, here's what I'm thinking. In our day, when we think of absolute rulers, Kim Jong-un, Adolf Hitler, Genghis Khan, It always goes badly for those who are ruled because we know what absolute power does to humanity. It corrupts them. It goes to their head. They begin to to live out their their whims uh, and oppress other people. But Jesus is not a ruler like that. He is an absolute ruler, but he is a loving ruler. He is a king that was willing to die for his subjects. He is a king that was willing to suffer the punishment that all of us Deserve. So when we hear this, that Jesus is going to come to his throne and he's going to destroy everyone that doesn't obey, it is not simply, oh, I don't want some mean guy ruling over me. That's not why the nations reject God. It is because of their pride. It is because of their desire to stand in God's place and determine their own destiny. That is why they reject him. It is brazen rebellion that drives these nations to refuse to obey the Lord. It is overbounding pride that motivates their stubborn refusal to submit to Christ. Jesus gave his own life to save anyone and everyone who will come to him. He died for his subjects. He could have crushed us all, but he didn't. He chose to leave glory and become a man and live among us and die for us to bring us into his family. Uh, Let me read again from... uh, Stephen Dempstry writes this, The vengeance of Yahweh is not irrational personal revenge to satisfy wounded ego. Because that would be us, right? Humans are like that. You hurt my pride and therefore I want to destroy you. He's saying, no, 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 that's not what God's doing. This is the exercise of legitimate sovereignty in a punishment that must occur if the rule of God is to be maintained against the self-seeking power and lusts of men. Thus, in order for there to be peace, there must be force exercised to establish it, but it is a force that is motivated finally by justice and love, not self-seeking, seeking, not egotism, justice and love. Matthew Henry adds, God will give his son either the hearts or the necks of his enemies and make them either his friends or his footstool. The Lord will welcome the nations that do obey him and submit to his rule. At the beginning of chapter 4 in Micah, he said, many nations will come to Israel to learn God's ways and walk in his path. So he is offering pardon. He's offering people to come uh, peaceably into his kingdom. But those that refuse, he will destroy. So here's the point of this passage. 
On the journey of hope, the Lord purifies his people from dependence on things other than him. And I want you to notice the emphasis. It is the Lord who purifies his people. You cannot purify yourself. Only the Lord can. Now, this is a promise that will be fulfilled completely in the future. But even now, God is working in us to purify us. Because even now we're tempted to turn to false objects of hope to get us through life. Even now we can turn our blessings into idols. And the text is saying God will remove anything and everything. Excuse me. I'll back up. This is a question. Is this text saying that God will remove everything else you trust in to show that he alone can be trusted? Well, in the future, yes. But that's not what he's saying is the case for each and every one of us today. And, and here's what I mean by that. One of the things that can happen when you're growing up in the church, because, of course, you're hearing texts like this, is you think, oh, if I love something a whole lot, God's going to take it away. So I really need to try to hold that in. Or even as an adult, you can think, man, I'm so happy right now. I just got married. Oh, shoot, that means God's going to do something to destroy this and mess this up because I'm, I'm enjoying myself. No, no, no. God's not out there trying to destroy our joy, okay? God is the actually trying to give us joy. But God does allow things in our lives. He does allow us to get into situations where our trust has to be in him alone. Very often we find ourselves facing a problem that no agency other than God can, can uh, solve. And so in times like that, of course, we are thrown completely upon God. Now, granted, there are times of tragedy, when God does remove something that we loved and held dearly. Sometimes there is a job that is lost. Sometimes there is health that is shattered. Sometimes there is a loved one that dies. And on those times, of course, we must throw ourselves upon God because who else do we have to go to? Who else can we lean upon? But God is not saying, be careful, I'm going to destroy you if you start loving something, okay? What he's saying is, I want your trust completely. On the journey of hope, the Lord purifies his people from dependence on things other than him. Now, even though it is the Lord who purifies, that doesn't mean that we're completely passive. Okay, you, God is working in your life to make you more like Jesus, and you can cooperate with that work, or you can resist that work. And all of us do both from time to time. But when we cooperate with his work, that is God's grace also. Philippians 2 said, God works in us both to will and to do. So when you want to please God, that's God doing that. And when you do please God, that's God doing that. He gets the credit. He gets the praise for everything. I seem to have lost the uh, last page. Here we go. Okay. Y weren't y'all happy to hear that phrase, last page? <laughs> okay, so let's talk about responses uh, to this passage. Uh, a few ways that you can respond to this. Uh, first of all, Praise the Lord for loving you and accepting you, even though your dependence is not always on him, even though we know that our trust is divided. As I said before, we're fallen people. We're hardwired to trust in something other than God because we have a sin nature. But there is someone whose dependence and trust was 100% on God his entire life, and that is Jesus when you put your faith in him, his righteousness is credited to you and God treats you the same way that he treats Jesus perfectly accepting you at all times. He accepts you as his beloved child in the moments when your faith is strong and in the moments when your faith is weak. In the moments when you just finished an hour-long praise session and in the moments when you just yelled at your eight-year-old. God accepts you and delights in you all through that. A second response, ask the Lord to show you areas where your faith is on something other than him. Uh, we know that our faith isn't perfectly on God. As I said, Jesus is the only one who's ever done that. We know that God accepts us anyway because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. But he is working to make us more like him by building our faith and strengthening our faith in him. And one way to cooperate with that work is to examine your heart for divided trust, ask your father to expose the things that draw your trust away from him. Ask him to give you strength to move your trust from that person or thing and put it back on him. Finally, uh, tell someone how you've learned to trust the Lord in some area where you used to trust, where you used to trust in other things. Few things build your faith as much as hearing a God-glorifying testimony from another believer 
And if you can look back on some particular area where you know you used to just constantly struggle with placing your faith in something other than God, and then you were delivered from that, tell somebody about that. That'll encourage them in their walk with the Lord. It'll encourage them uh, that God is at work even in a uh, screw-up like yourself. That wasn't in my notes. I shouldn't have said that. I lost my place. Okay. uh, Well, speaking of trust and speaking of purification, there are four people today that are going to be baptized as a testimony of their trust in the Lord Jesus, as a testimony that he has saved them and has purified them, loves them and brings them into his family. So here's what we need to do. Uh, The baptism will be going down in about 10 minutes outside. If you have children in the kids' area, I'm going to ask you to go get them so that the teachers over there can also come to watch the baptism. And then you are welcome to watch the baptism in here. We'll be on the screens or to go outside. Uh, This is an opportunity for us to continue worshiping because we are going to show the world the saving power of God. Four people are going to stand up and say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus has saved me. Let's give him praise and honor for that. Now, for those of you who do not need to go pick up kids or who do not need to go out and get ready for the baptism, then uh, you will have the opportunity to pray with someone up front. So prayer team, if you could come forward. If you want prayer about uh, one of your responses to the message today, or if you need prayer about something that you're facing, if you want to pray to know the Lord, any of the people up here would be delighted to pray with you about that. So uh, let me close in prayer, and Lord willing, someone else will come up here and introduce myself. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, praise you for this word from you, that one day, Lord God, you are going to purify your people. It is coming. And we also praise you, Lord, that you are working to purify us even now and that you are loving us even through that messy process of us walking and crawling and stumbling and falling. You are loving us in and through that whole process. God, I thank you for your abundant grace. I thank you for the opportunity and the blessing to watch these young people get baptized. Thank you for your work in our congregation. Lord, I ask again, for your blessing of grace on everyone who has gathered here this morning. I pray that they would walk in the joy and knowledge of your Son. In your holy name I pray. Amen.